Hey, welcome to the Insurance Buzz. This is your host, Michael Weaver, and I've got Rob Dow with us today. Rob, how are you? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you so much for having yeah, me. Yeah, no, thank you for uh, thank you for coming on. I'm super uh, super pumped to talk to a rock star like yourself. So, Rob, I start I start every episode off the same way. Who was uh, who was Rob before insurance? Yeah, Rob, uh, before insurance, um, if you ask my brain, was a failure. Um, it was a lot of potential. I grew up uh, excelling in sports, excelling in soccer. After, uh, after high school, I actually went to New Zealand and played soccer in hopes of pursuing it professionally and realized there wasn't an income uh, that matched my goals. And so I came back and sort of had to rewire my brain and realize that nothing is given and have to earn. So I had to go to college and kind of retrain my brain of what it takes to succeed and uh, been on that journey since. Uh, but for me in college, I looked at the wealthiest people that I knew and coincidentally, they were all in insurance. And so me getting into insurance was intentional uh, just because I saw what that income potential and also lifestyle could be. So while in college, I worked at an insurance agency just doing cold calling. Um, and I looked at the owner and the nice car he drove and the house behind the gate that he was in and said, I want that. And since then, this is all I've been doing. I love that, man. How long were you over in uh, New Zealand for? Uh, that was about six months, and it was great because as a young uh, man who grew up in a very you know middle class home and everything was sort of given, it sort of taught me that nothing was given. I was dirt poor there and uh, had to get by, and and also it was good as like a young man to just sort of be on my own and realize the thoughts in my head, what was real, and kind of challenge myself and put myself in an uncomfortable position. And I feel like I still pull from a lot of the lessons there. Oh, that's um, that, that's cool, man. I've been to New Zealand one time, and it was uh, it, it's pretty magical over there. Quite frankly, just uh, it, it's wild. It's cold. <laughs> it was cold. <laughs> uh, magical and cold. <laughs> no, so all right, so straight out of college, you you see success, you follow success. You're like, hey, I want to be like this guy. So what did cold? So you mentioned cold calling which is a, a term that turns a lot of people off. Um, what did you learn from, from cold calling, smiling and dialing? Talk, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, for me, it was never um, an internal struggle. Like I never took the rejection personally. I took it as a challenge. And so I wanted to try and figure out how to allow uh, myself to succeed and to figure out different personalities. So one thing I should say is um, upon returning from New Zealand, I worked at the Ritz Carlton and the Ritz Carlton, everybody knows as one of the best hotels in the world. It's very expensive. Uh, it's high end, but it also taught me the difference of uh, and similarities in people and the difference between wealthy and rich and how you treat people. So it was really like a sociological study on just the mindset of people and how common we all are and how similar we all are. And so that also helped me pull. Um, so I worked at an insurance agency and I worked at the Ritz at the same time while in college. Um, and what cold calling is a turnoff to most people. It's not my favorite thing to do. For me, it was the grind necessary to get that one yes. And that's all it took was to get that one yes. Um, for me, while I was working there, the producer closed that. And I remember I made like $500 in commission from generating that opportunity. Um, and that was that was life changing. I was like, this is amazing. You know, of course, I spent it all. But, um, you know, that was OK. I now see this. What's the next step? Oh, that producer actually made five thousand dollars. I just got a little cut of that. Well, I want to do what that producer's doing. Mm, the grind. That's always so you, you just brought up something though I want to hit on before we go into <clears throat> insurance. So you said rich and wealthy. Is there a difference? I think so. Um, now, this is a painting with a broad stroke, but we sort of found that the, the individuals uh, that were wealthy had humility for the most part, uh, had a general warmth for the most part, and could engage in a conversation with us as, you know, hotel employees, treated us as gentlemen, um, and weren't necessarily there to have us serve them in any sort of um, hierarchy, where a lot of times we found 
the rich, and I just call rich is maybe perhaps new money. And again, this is generals. There's always, uh, you know, uh, the outliers. Uh, they were a little bit ruder. And uh, they would look to us and their prized possessions. In this case, if they came into a Ferrari with a Ferrari, uh, they would look at this and say, "Like you can't drive this. This is my Ferrari." Where the wealthy guys, like I don't, this means nothing to me. And so um, we sort of realized that as well. Um, and so that that was the biggest difference. And I would say a, a general confidence and humility was always a lot more. Um, enjoyable to work with and something that I really want to strive to be as a person. I'm not wealthy or rich, but I would love to be known as that as a takeaway with any interaction that I have. Now, I um, <clears throat> I love that. And I, I had to ask you that because it's the few wealthy people I have um, had the privilege of being around. It's like in the Midwest, we have this old saying, when, when you have money, you don't have to tell people you have money. And uh, right. just that just very humble Whereas um, I'm with you, man. Rich is like, look at my new toys. So it's uh, and I think wealthy is a lifestyle. I think it's more than just money. It's it's health. It's happiness. It's it's abundance mindset. And so I, I love that. And and I have to share. Um, I've said I've shared this with many farmers agents, but I have a large client. He owns about 160 apartment complexes in California. Um, you know, each apartment complex is about five million dollars in in value and up to he generates about three to four million dollars a month and uh, he's a wonderful client and the premium is close to a million dollars he spends and when I went and met with him uh, he drove a 25 year old truck and uh, was in a shirt with stains on it and was so um, non-assuming and then in speaking with him he shared with me that he's written checks for a half a million dollars to chair, uh, to orphanages in third world countries. He's a Christian gentleman and uh, anonymously. And I said, what a, what a wonderful life. Here I am in my suit and my nice car. That's a lease that I'm paying too much for. And I felt like, oh, almost like a fraud. Like here's I'm trying to be somebody, but here's somebody who's actually doing it and living it out and making a difference in the world. What a wonderful thing to attain to. And he's been a client and a mentor of mine for the last six or seven years. Um, and all I do is just pick his brain, but I'm also in awe of the way he presents himself. And so mm. <clears throat> I love that. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. That's uh, that's good. So, OK, so insurance, you see people wildly successful. You see the lifestyle they're living is that ultimately like the major decision making why you went into insurance or, or what else pulled you into insurance? Yeah, as a 20 as in my 20s, yeah, that was what I thought the ultimate goal was was the big house and the nice car and as I've now um getting towards the end of my 30s and married uh and four kids, those goals have shifted. Now I still want financial peace. Uh I still am known to like some of the finer things in life. Uh, but truly what I want to do is create a legacy for my kids, uh, but also show them that with work ethic, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, the the income can come if that's it. But how can we also impact other people's lives on a personal level? And I think insurance allows me to do that because we're meeting people from all different walks of life. And my favorite thing to do is to make connections between people who are looking for things. You know, I, oh, you know what? I'm actually interested in this. Funny you say that. I have a client who does that. I'd love to make an introduction. And that sort of relationship building is really fulfilling to me as well. Um, and, and the last thing that we kind of discussed is uh, giving back is I have stolen so many great ideas from much more successful agents than mine and have found myself in a position that I'm able to help new agents and I really get a lot of fulfillment in that sort of training aspect and letting them say, see, hey, I'll tell you all the mistakes that I've made. I've made a ton. I'll tell you how I still feel like I'm failing every day, uh, but I've tried to grow from those and these are the mistakes that I would look to avoid and I really do get a lot of enjoyment from that. No, that's, um, there's something about, there is that giving back. Like I'm a firm believer in what you, what you put on into the world is what you're going to receive back from it. And so I, it's just, it's funny. Like the more personally, the more money that we've, we've given, the more money that we continue to make, like in return on a, on a yearly basis. It's just, it is wild. Like it, I don't know how to ex exactly explain it, but it's uh, it's very interesting. 
Yeah. Well, I don't want this to be a religious podcast, but I do think <laughs> it's a God thing. So, uh, uh, but at least for me, I, I truly believe what you're saying is true. Um, and uh, hopefully, regardless of what anybody's faith is, is there's there's truth to that. And it's in giving we receive in all aspects of life, friendship, business, financial. That's right. That's right. So so obviously, you had massive success. You own, you own multiple agencies, correct? Yeah, I don't know how you describe that. I've, I've acquired a couple agencies, um, and I have two locations, one in Los Angeles, one in Orange County, and 10 employees. Yeah, so, and you've, I mean, you've got the awards, you've, you've I mean, you're, you're, you're at the top of the game when it comes to insurance professionals from a recognition standpoint, I would say. So somebody just doesn't get their... Um, accidentally all right so and it's just not about selling it's not about the processes it's a lot about and i in my belief obviously mindset leadership but it all starts with you it starts with the top down so what are some things that you think maybe a younger a younger rob like if you had to go back talk to yourself from day mm-hmm. one what would you what would you be telling your, your younger self that's going to go into agency yeah. Uh, you know, I started this by saying I felt like I was a failure and that was because I have um, so much potential, but I didn't live it out. Um, and whether it was academics, uh, whether it was through sports, even though I decided to pull back from that, I felt like I had a lot of potential and I had the desire, but the missing link was the grind, was the work ethic. And I had to go and rewire my brain and really what started that was physical fitness. You know, your brain might think you're strong or you could do anything, but if you pick up a barbell and you can barely lift it, that's a little bit of humbling. And so I sort of went on this pro, this journey of starting to work out and realizing, um, you know, I'm one weight on the bar to failing and realizing maybe I should do some work internally and lower the ego, lower the pride, and just start all over. And that's really what I tried to do. And so the message to my younger self, which although I wouldn't have been able to hear it at that point, uh, was um, get ready to grind. And it was through many mistakes and failures that I pushed through and endured. And I'm so thankful that I did because I'm now on this side and I get anxiety thinking of some of the struggles we had, my wife and I had when we were first married, the, some of the financial struggles. Um, and so that could have been avoided, but it was necessary in order for me to build up that internal uh, grind mentality. I, I don't, I, I don't want to, or grit is a better word for it. Uh, and, and as a result, those recognitions have come. now. I, I'm not short on ego still. I'm not short of pride. Uh, we often joke that I have millions of little minions in my head that are constantly cheering my name, you know? And so I have a lot of confidence that I can do a lot of things. Uh, but perhaps now I've actually, for one of the first times in my life, uh, actually proven results of that. And now it's like, a, now I'm addicted to it. I'm obsessed with it. I mean, uh, and that's that's probably the long-winded answer of what I would tell myself. No, I think um, <clears throat> it's funny because I <clears throat> ego can be a funny thing. And I think um, sometimes when you end up taking the plunge, sometimes that can humble you. But confidence, because there's a difference. There's a difference between ego and confidence. And um, you're very, I can tell you're confident, but you're not like, <laughs> your, your ego is not shining through. And so there, and there's a difference in probably because of the struggles. And so I'd like you to talk about like when you say grind, what does grind look like? Oh, it's such a great callback. And anybody that's listening, this is unprepared, but uh, there, this, is, this isn't a loaded question. But essentially for me, as it relates to insurance, goes back to what I did in college was the cold calling. Uh, when my wife and I were first married, we had zero money. And I just sort of said, hey, you know what? I'm commission only. Uh, that's, that's my compensation. And so I realized the difference between my goals uh, coming to fruition or not relied on me. And there was no harder way but clearer way than cold calling. And unfortunately, I didn't work smart then. So I just went down a phone book and I just called. And I said, if I challenge myself to call 100 people a day, I just need to book one appointment. 
give me one appointment a day if I can do that. And I'm speaking specifically towards like commercial insurance. If I can book one business a day, uh, then that's okay, 20 appointments a month. And if I can close one or two of those, I can get some commission. And I tell this story often. Uh, the first account I closed was a liquor store. It was just general liability. The commission was $50 and I cried. I remember, I'll never forget walking up the street saying like, I needed that so much. Like I needed it for my, my strength and my, and my affirmation, but I also needed the money. And then I was like, when do I get paid on this? Like I need this. And so, um, that almost served itself as a stepping stone where it was like, okay, now I'm starting to see some success. I'm getting in through the businesses. I'm now closing the business. I'm now leveling up in terms of commission. Uh, let's just keep doing that. And I kind of held true to that for a long time. Now, in this new age of 2022, I still think there's a lot of opportunity for people to do that. Uh, everybody wants to send a Facebook post. I just don't think that's going to produce the results. It really has to be a more of a proactive approach. Uh, and you can do proactive marketing on social media. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, be charming. You have to sell. You have to find people, make that connection. Because no matter what business you're in, sales is relationships. That's really what it is. And so uh, that's that's essentially that mindset that I've I've taken. And still to this day, our agency motto is sell one policy a day. And uh, we. And then when we did that successfully for 30 days, it was, hey, we did this. Let's do it again. And then when we did that, let's sell two policies a day. And as a result, we continue to do that more and more. Mm. I, so you don't know this. I, I, I always say, I, so we, when I started the agency, we had no money to market. So very similar, mm -hmm. literally pound the right, phone, man. Yeah. Like that's, um, and I've always said, I love cold calling. And it's not that I love cold calling. Like I'm not psycho, like I'm not psychotic, like, but I, right. <clears throat> In my opinion, cold calling even today is the most efficient way to contact an X amount of people per day versus any other advertised spend you can do. Um, I was just actually looking at something by Grant Cardone yesterday, and he was saying cold calling is hands down like six times. He's narrowed it down to six times more effective than any advertising dollar you can spend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then as a business owner, how do you train that? So how do you... Um See, uh, seeing, mm, I guess this is me projecting, but the seeing the look on my face when I went to buy dinner for my wife and I and my car got declined at In-N-Out was the motivator for me to push through any sort of negative laziness or anything when it came to approach, when it came to cold calling. So for that reason, I had my motivation. I knew my why. As a business owner, how do you give that why or coach up that why to somebody that might not have that struggle, those desires? That is the million dollar question and the hardest part of, in my perspective, being a business owner, because I know I can do it, I have, but how do I train or coach up or recruit sim similar wiring? And that, that I, I still don't know the answer to that. We try, but uh, don't know the answer. <laughs> And I think there's such a negative connotation to like when you say cold calling, I think people just like they just collapse in their chair like what cold calling like and I think it's just a mindset of look internet leads like those are pretty much like cold calls too like because nine out of ten of them don't even know who you're calling so right. that's a mindset shift but you you just hit on something I, I heard that I was reading a book by Grant Hill called The Game and he said this the other day you can't you can't teach hungry. They're either right. hungry okay. or they're not hungry. And that's the first, that's the first thing that came to my mind. Like, I, yes, you got to find that why and you have to find your purpose and that passion. And I think that's your, that is our jobs as leaders. Can you teach, like, can you teach hungry? So then this is something that I always think about is, is, um, no, but then that leads you to be cynical, right? Because you bring in an employee, you already can tell on a moment's notice uh, based on your conversations, oh, this person gets it or it doesn't. However, then I think of like the Lakers or Phil Jackson or, you know, Bill Belichick. They have all these different players and they're bringing the best out of them to get the goal. Now, is everybody going to be as hungry as Tom Brady or Kobe Bryant? No chance. But if you can get them to be 60% and this person to be 40%, 
then is that the way to go? And so that's kind of the hard part. When I first started, I was looking for like-minded individuals, which is really hard. I'm, I'm nutty. My wife will tell you I'm obsessive about this. Um, but it's, okay, then how do we cultivate that? And that's kind of where I've seen a big shift in, in myself, in our agency over the last couple of years, and really has propelled us to growth and building a team and I still don't feel like that confident that I have mastered it, but I've definitely gotten better at it and known my flaws with it. Because somebody who has your mindset and has my mindset, it's almost a turn off, right? When we don't see it, we're just like, listen, you gotta figure it out. Like, I don't know what to tell you, I figured it out. Why can't you figure it out? But as a leader, that's like the worst thing to say is like, you gotta coach them up and positive affirmation. And you know, and I, I do rely heavily on uh, you know, successful people, their quotes you call Grant Cardone or athletes. I, I, I live off of like that kind of motivation. It's daily affirmation for me. So what have you found is the best way to coach up? Like you're, like you're talking about, like getting that extra 5% just cause it's just a little bit. It's not like we need a lot of it. it it's just a little bit. Yeah. Well, funny enough, you say this is that uh, farmers is hosting a big conference and one of the topics that I'm speaking on is staffing and how to do that. And the pledge that I make to every one of my employees is I want this to be the best job you've ever had. Now with that comes a lot of responsibility from me. And that's a scary thing because responsibility requires accountability, follow through and truly um, delivering on that promise. So if I have you and you were to say, I would like to work at the Dow agency. Great. I'm, I'd love to hire you. Uh, but uh, if I would then say to you, I want this to be the best job you've ever had, what would it take for that to happen? Well, somebody like you might say, I want to make a million dollars a year. Great. Let's figure out a plan, not only from a personal growth standpoint, but a professional growth standpoint to get you that million dollars. When do you want that million dollars? 10 years? Done. We can do this. Here's the results or here's the effort that you're going to need. I'm going to help you get there. I could do everything but the action. Whereas a lot of my uh, staff are moms and their priority isn't to make a million dollars, although they would like to, uh, but their priority is to be present in their kids' lives. Um, and so what I have is a blanket policy that none of my employees are ever gonna miss a school event for any of their kids because of work. And as a result, it's allowed me to attract a lot better talent uh, employees perhaps not match their salary where they worked at large firms, but appreciate that flexibility, but also my genuine uh, approach to this is we only live once and I'm a dad and I have kids and I have this job because I don't want to miss an event. So I'm not going to make you miss an event for that and we'll figure it out as a team. And the feedback from that is great and it creates a mutual respect. And as a result, we're all covering each other's backs and I think we're getting better results out of everybody because they feel appreciated and seen and there's a give and take. And I've yet to have one employee take advantage of that. Uh, and even if they did, I wouldn't care because if they lied and said they had a school event and they went to the beach anyways, they needed it anyways. I'm just not that rigid when it comes to that. Oh, there's one thing that's coming to my mind, culture, like a winning culture right. that people can buy into. Um, there's <clears throat> right now. So we just interviewed like a hundred people over the last month. And there's, there's a con there's a consistent word that keeps continuing to get brought up and it's mentorship, mm -hmm. mentorship, like somebody that actually cares, like just not a number in an organization, just not a nine to five job for a paycheck. Like, do you actually care? Are you going to show you care? Mm -hmm. And I, that's what I feel. That's like, I, I you're not saying this, but that is what's screaming from everything you say. Yes. I also, um, going back to the hotel and working at the Ritz Carlton, the best manager we had was a uh, former military. And we were at that time doing valet. And if a wedding came in and there was a hundred cars that came in all at one time, it created a bottleneck situation, a bad experience for the hotel, bad for client guests who were trying to get out. So there was a huge emphasis on us being efficient, but working together as a team. And we had a manager prior to uh, this manager I'm going to discuss who said, all right, here's the event. And we never saw him again. 
He was inside in the air conditioning while we were out there working, which is fine. He earned that position until we got the new manager who set, laced up his shoes and said, let's do this together as a team. Hey, if we can get this done in an hour, I got pizza for everybody coming. And that stuck with me and still does because he was in the trenches with us. And I think our employees need to see that we're in the trenches with, uh, with them too. And oftentimes I think a lot of employers will say, hey, peace out. I'm off to Hawaii for two weeks. Handle it. That's what I pay you for. And not that you shouldn't take vacations, but you also can't give shade when your employee wants to do that same thing, you know, saying, well, you're letting down the team. And I find that there's a lot of that discontent shared between employers and employees. And it's exactly what you said in terms of culture. Now, let me ask you advice. Everybody at my job, their satisfaction, I, I feel confident that they will say, I love my job. Where I struggle is the results then, because we love our job, but I also need you to love your job and sell 10 policies today. And then when they don't, it's that weird feeling of tension. Hey, I remember that Friday I let you take off. Like, I need you to grind here. Why aren't you doing that? And that's something that I'm still trying to get better because I have a, going back to our, our approach of teaching the hungry, how do you balance really a great good culture and a nice place to work but also sort of the bad the bad side of it which is hey we gotta push you need to push why didn't you push and that's something that i'm getting i need to get a lot better if i were to give myself a grade on it i'm an f i really am i'm bad at that accountability on a personal level and i think <clears throat> so transparently that's something i i always struggled with because you build you build relationships with your team like you build relationships. You love right, these people. Right. However, at the end of the day, like they also have to feel satisfied in what they're doing or else you're not really doing like, and so there's that fine line. So my question would be for you is if you don't do that, have you ever hired anyone to do that for you? Like that integrator type of personality, that like That's COO good. type of personality. Right. That's a great question. And so, uh, one of the best things that I did for my agency was hire, uh, an operations manager. And uh, she is a little bit better at the bad cop situation. Now, I'm also getting a lot better because that's not her job. Ultimately, the buck stops with me. And so while I appreciate accountability on a smaller sense, going back to this being the best job you've ever had and wanting you to develop both professionally and personally, um, I don't need somebody nagging at them. I think that responsibility goes to me. And so I've done a lot better at creating systems to create that accountability within the system, such as uh, every one of my employees sends me an email at the end of the day with everything that they accomplished, the things that are still pending, and you know wins. And then as a result, once my kids go to bed, I send a recap email to the entire team. Now I'd much rather be watching you know, the new Game of Thrones show, which I haven't gotten to yet, but that is the sacrifice that I'm willing to make for an overall team. And now, as things are getting more virtual and employees are wanting to work from home more, this emphasis on accountability and over-communication is becoming even more important and something that I've really had to push myself to get better at because it's so easy to be like, whatever, I'm not going to do it. Uh, but what fit, the employees don't care, uh, but I think what fails is they say he's inconsistent. And inconsistency can allow grace for inconsistency on their part. I need them to know that I'm all in, whether I'm on vacation or, you know, through the grind. And so um, that's, you know, that's kind of how I feel like I still need to improve. You know, I started the call with saying I feel like a failure because I always feel like I just need to improve. Um, I've heard many farmers agents say, uh, you know, very happy, never satisfied. That is me to a T. I'm joyful. I think happy is fleeting. I'm very joyful, but I'm never satisfied. I feel internally like I need to improve. I need to improve. And even when I achieve a success, uh, you know, within farmers, you can get president's council. That's the top 5% in the entire company at a 14,000. I had all sites on that. And when I did it, I was proud of myself for a second. And I said, yeah, but I want to be the number one agent in the company. And my wife's like, chill out. You just, you just obsessed about this. You won this. And I was like, yeah, but I really want to be number one. And it was just trying to find that balance between ambition as well as success and really 
uh, enjoying that, I guess. So you hit on so many good points right there. Um, I think, so number one, the checker checks, the checker gets what the checker checks. All right. Like that's a, that's an old saying and it's so true. So how can you overly communicate without micromanaging to set your team up for success on a daily basis? And then obviously I'm a big fan of one-on-ones as well. Like I think one-on-ones on, Mm -hmm. on a, Weekly basis is what we like, um, especially in a remote setting, just because you establish that relationship and things like that. But I think overly, because there's a difference between micromanaging and just helping your people achieve what you need them to be to achieve. To Because with mm-hmm. them winning, they feel productive. When they feel productive, they feel satisfied. Like there's that, that passion, that satisfaction, because in insurance, if you're not if you're not feeling productive, you're feeling busy and busy leads to burnout. Right. That's a good point. And what I want to say is I heard a farmer's agent that you reminded me of two things. One from Dan Kitajima's previous podcast with uh, David Sewell, who's a legacy within farmers. Uh, he, his philosophy is talk to every one of his employees every single day. He has multiple employees in every location. When he said that, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, oh, there's often times where I'm like, oh, I didn't even, I didn't even talk to that employee today. And what's it take? Five seconds? You know? And so I, I, since then, it's been a month, about a month since they've sent that email. I've been really intentional with that. The next thing you touched on was micromanaging. There's another really successful uh, farmer's agent. I believe he's in Arkansas. And I heard him call back to the former Disney CEO that said micromanaging is underrated. Now, in interviews, I used to tell my, you know, hires, hey, I'm never going to micromanage you. Like, that's not my style because I thought that's what people wanted to hear. I stopped saying that. Like, what am I doing? That's, that's completely creating the wrong expectations. There is a balance between accountability and not micromanaging, but it's also everything's like training. You know, it, hey, I heard you say that. This is something that I would have done differently. And so micromanaging gets a bad rap. But I'll tell you, my success since I heard that two years ago is directly tied to micromanaging, you know, the small little details that's created the bigger wins. It's, it's, the book is slipping my mind right now, but Patrick Lencioni, I, I read a book by him last year, and he said exactly what you're saying. Like, my, you, you have to, mic- like, as a leader, you have to micromanage because that's what ultimately holds folks accountable, shows them how to win, and they win, which means that they have more satisfaction in what they're doing. And so I dig that, man. Like you're hitting on, on so many good points right now. Um, I could go. I just wish I was coming up with them. I've never had an original thought. I just steal it from everybody else. I'm like, Oh, you're so wise. I wish I knew that. But, uh, but as long as we can saturate it and then implement it, that's the important. Well, that's, I, I don't, but you're hitting on a valid point right now. Like I think you're always, at least I have this mindset and I know you just talked to Dan, but you're always learning. Okay. It's okay to be a beginner. Like you're never going to know everything. Cause if you know everything, well, then you're, you're probably complacent. Your mindset's probably ruined and, and you're probably done. Like if you're not growing right. and developing and learning, what are you doing exactly? Yeah. I, I, I might've spoken about this when I talked to Dan, but, uh, fear is a major driver of mine. Uh, fear of being stagnant, fear of, Not necessarily growth. You know, it's not like I want to grow to a 50 person agency. I certainly want to grow an income. That's important to me. Uh, But I just have this fear of complacency because that is when the fall starts to happen. And in insurance, we're always losing policies. Every agency is losing policies. So if we're not bringing new policies in, we're failing. And I just am so scared of that ever happening that I don't allow myself to take my foot off the gas pedal. Now, I've been doing the, you know, I've been doing insurance for about 12 years now. I still feel like I have a ton of energy. Uh, there again, a call back to Dan Kitajima's podcast with David Sewell. He's been doing it for 35 plus years. He's been a president's council agent for 30 plus years and he still has that energy and it gave me like hope like oh, I hope I can have that too. Because like you said, burnout is is so common and insurance is boring now insurance isn't like as as a as a industry it's boring as a talking point it's boring at a party it's a conversation killer uh but 
the experiences that we get to have, the relationships, and some of the really cool things that would have never happened because of insurance. And in addition to what I've been able to provide for my family and those kinds of things because of insurance, now that's cool. And you show me another industry that can do that kind of stuff, it's few and far between. And so, um, but you're, uh, you know, 100% right about that burnout. Yeah, man, it's just, um, I mean, what the financial services industry produces more millionaires than any other industry right, in the world. Right. And you get, and you get, that's the, that's the beautiful thing. I always tell insurance professionals, I think you'll have the, the most noble profession out of anybody in, in America, at least maybe the world. I mean, you're having conversations with people that nobody else is having, and there's something to be said about that. Yeah. I mean, legit, uh, Two days ago, not only a, a huge client of ours, but a huge referral source. He's a very successful mortgage broker. Called me on his way up to his home where there's a fire in California, and he said, "Dude, like they're shutting this thing down. I, I want to go and get all my belongings there." He's like, "Do we have enough coverage?" Oh, it's really real of what we do. We can talk about income, uh, but there's the flip side of what happen. What what happens if we don't do our job the right way? Everything could be in peril, and so. There's really real consequences to not doing things properly. And again, I said, fear is a major driver. I have that fear. I have that fear of that call saying my home burned down and we didn't do a good job. And I, I take complete responsibility for that. I'm really scared of that. So I try and instill that with our staff where more importantly than any sales or trophy is essentially uh, making sure that families are protected, businesses are protected, and any agent that's been in this for long enough has their 10 top claim stories of how things went well, and maybe they also have 10 where they could have done things differently. And uh, I try and very much err on the side of caution uh, because it's only a matter of time. Oh yeah, y'all are dealing with people on their worst day. So <clears throat> you went back to something I don't know if you know anything about Enneagrams. I would imagine you're probably an Enneagram 3 if I had to guess. But you said something about being an achiever and you hit presence club, I believe is what you said. And then you're like, I want to yeah. be number one. And so always moving the goalpost. Um, like you get it and then how can I get just a little bit better? So my question for you is, is how do you... Number one, because there's something to be said, that's like a double-edged sword, because like, you're always pushing. You're always always trying to get better, always pushing for that next thing, but how can you also feel accomplished at the same time and actually slow down and take that in? Um, so this becomes like a more existential question for me personally, because as much as I... I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I love, I love the acclaim. I love the awards. I want to see my name at the top of the leaderboard. Uh, I'd be lying, and a lot of people are who uh, do, uh, if they say that's not a goal. Uh, in fact, if I see my name at number two, that bothers me, and it's a motivator. So uh, we can take a deep dive into, into that wiring. Uh, for me, there has to be a balance, and I want my identity not to be Rob Dow star farmers insurance agent um, i want my identity to be in family and faith and community and that's easy to say that's a platitude you know but where are you actually being putting that action into into words and so um, i have to work on that on a daily basis so you know we're, we're, we can talk about this as well uh, in the morning i have a routine i'm habitual by nature but i'll wake up in the morning and i'll go work out and then after that is my time. I know a lot of people do meditation. They'll do Bible study. For me, that's while I'm working out, I'm getting my mind right. I'm doing uh, my affirmations, my prayers, and everything like that. Uh, but it's trying to really put into perspective of what the day is. I've already woke up and felt a grind physically. So nothing is going to compare to that. Um, and I don't know if you've heard in California, it's like 105 degrees right now. So even, even at 6 in the morning, uh, we're, you know, we're, we're approaching 95 degrees. But I do think there's a lot of truth to that kind of mindset that parallels to your question and allows for clarity as well as peace. So while professionally, I, I don't know if I'll ever be satisfied because the truth is, is if I got that call that you're the agent of the year of Farmers Insurance, there's no doubt in my mind that I would say, let's run it back. 
you know, and so, uh, and then it's two years and then it's a three peat and has anybody done, you know, and so I, I just know that's how I am. So I do embrace that, but also see that let's not put a lot of emphasis in that. And at the end of the day, uh, as I'm becoming, you know, as I'm 37 years old and life becomes more real, meaning, you know, you have kids and your friends, maybe you have a friend that's gotten sick or you've lost loved ones. Perspective is really important. And I don't think I had that maybe in my early 20s. It was very much about me. But now realizing how fleeting this life is and how blessed we are to be here today um, is a daily reminder. And that counteracts that never satisfied goalpost. While that's never going to change, um, I still try and work on that ultimately. Yeah, man, you hit on so many good points right there because um, it's funny you bring this up. I was just talking to a gentleman last night that he lost his lost his father and um and so the 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 brother was like and the brother's wife actually just developed uh alzheimer's um the the dad's brother and he's like go on the trips man make the memories life is short right and so you have to have that especially as a high high performer high achiever it's prioritizing what's important and i think that everything else follows like if, if if you if you have the right pri priorities if you're doing the right things you're going to show up in your as a husband you're going to show up as a spouse you're going to show up as a leader in your business but i think the one thing i love that you just said is you got to you got to lead yourself first which is ultimately what i'm gathering from from kind of what you're saying yeah and i have to i have to say uh, I'm the biggest sinner in the room because two years ago, I wasn't living that out. Two years ago, I was waking up at 4.30 or 5 in the morning, going to the gym and going straight to the office after and then coming home at 5 o'clock. But in that time, missing mornings with the kids, missing school, you know, getting them all ready. And, um, and when, you know, COVID happened, everything kind of changed. But also I was hit like a ton of bricks of, hey, wait there can be a balance. What I was doing was way wrong. It wasn't just grind, grind, grind. Like, that's not fun. That's not enjoyable. And who, who loses in that? I lose, my family loses, my kid loses, uh, my children lose. And I really changed my perspective there. And, but you get into these routines where you think I have to do it. I have to do it. And that's, that's, that's the enemy lying to you. That's really it. That's just uh, um, something we tell ourselves to affirm our behavior but not necessarily true. And so that balance that we've talked about certainly can exist and certainly can exist with a highly motivated individual as myself and goal oriented individual. Uh, but like you said, all my friends will laugh. Uh, they know I'm a win in Rome type of person. They're like, let's go, you know, like I am all in, let's go and experience those things because uh, let's do, you know, you never know. In addition to also with family, affirm them and, 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 tell them because you do never know and that, that sits very uh heavy on my heart and at the forefront of my mind always no man i appreciate your transparency because this is something that i think a lot of a lot of folks um like myself like a struggle with it like it's it's a daily struggle even though like you do it you prioritize it's still a struggle because you're always i don't know it's, it's weird how you're wired but um but rob man i, I know uh i know time is super important i know um I know we've been on for almost 45 minutes now so i man i can't tell you how much i appreciate your time this has been this has been awesome i feel like i could continue to talk to you for another hour or two. i love this stuff so i appreciate your time man what would be the best if somebody wanted to connect with you do you have social media handles anything that someone could follow you what does that look like i do i just find just find me on facebook that's probably the best way rob dow uh is on facebook i have business accounts and stuff like that but happy to um, have a chat with anybody. Everything that I have learned, I've gotten from much more successful agents that I hope to be. Um, but also, if anybody who just wants to chat, I'm, I'm willing, I can give five minutes to anybody. No, man, I appreciate you. Um, all of you obviously listening, as you know, time is the most valuable and important asset that we all have. I appreciate you spending some time with Rob and I today. Rob, thank you again, my man. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks. Go out and make it great, my friends.